couple things I kind of want. How many of you know we're going to get some rain? Maybe a little snow. And your pastor is happy. Because he's going hunting Saturday. I see some of you looking like deer in the headlights out there already. It's like, you go and kill Bambi? No, I kill Bambi's daddy. <laughs> so, sorry, I just had to throw that in. I mean, I know we're about ready to watch Mary Poppins, so I'm kind of trying to get everything out here. But I want to explain something really quickly, if I may. The Holy Spirit was really moving on me a few moments ago with the evidence of speaking in tongues and giving the word of evidence, uh, interpretation. Maybe you're not familiar with that gift, and so I like to at least, if I do move sometimes in that, if you'll open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the nine gifts that work in the body of Christ and the church itself. And two of those gifts are tongues and interpretation. Some is the word of prophecy, discerning of spirits, a number of other gifts are there as well. But those two gifts are to operate. And later on, Paul writes about that same gift. And it was for specifically this service this morning, right now. But let me say something clearly. The word says that tongues aren't always just for the believer but they're also for the unbeliever. And a lot of people don't understand that about the evidence of speaking in tongues with the power of that. That it says that it ministers to the unbeliever. Now, let me tell you a story about myself. Most of you know this story, but when I was a young man, Sandy asked me to go to her water baptism. I was 17 at the time, uh, just turned 17, and had my driver's license and drove into her church and people were coming out of, up out of the water speaking in tongues when they were being water baptized. It was an assembly church, and I had never been exposed to that. And my mind had a very hard time wrapping itself at a 17-year-old never being in church, wrapping my mind around that. Around that. So uh, there was a peculiar thing that happened. This story is in, one of my, in my book, Shoulder to Shoulder. But out of that experience, my flesh had such a hard time dealing with that that I ran three miles home and left my car in town. At the church, literally, I did. And my mom, when I got into the house, I was profusely sweating. At that time, I could run seven, eight miles, have no problem, but I just ran home. I was so kind of intense about it that, like I said, my mind could not deal with it. And I remember thinking, in fact, like I said, when I drove in, my mom said, well, I didn't hear your car. And I said, oh, my car. <laughs> I mean, this might sound like a fairy tale, but this really happened. I am telling you, Sandy is a witness of this. So my mother had to end up taking me back in town to get my car. It was over, actually, it was 11 years or 10 years approximately later that I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was 27 at the time. October the 23rd, 1976. I will never forget it. Uh, it was such a powerful experience in my life. And I tell you this because I went to school the next day and told Sandy, don't ever invite me back to your church again. <laughs> but deep inside of me, though I was an unbeliever and didn't know Jesus, I knew those people had something. And for 10 years, not knowing the Lord, I never, ever... I would actually say, well, I believe there's a higher power. I know there's something out there. I don't think the universe could just work like it does. But I never knew the power of Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, if you're here this morning, you're not going to wait till the end of the service to accept Jesus. We can take care of that right now. Amen. And so I'd like you to bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, is there anybody here that doesn't know you? or has backslidden and wants to come back to you as their father. I pray, Father, right now that we have the honor and the privilege to pray with them. To not, if you will, join a church or a movement, but to have a relationship with Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so if anybody's here, all they have to do is slip their hand up. We're not going to embarrass them. We're not asking them to join this church. We're inviting them into the body of Christ. 
And so if that is you in any way, without anybody looking around, would you just slip your hand up right now so we could pray with you? Anybody in this house? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And everybody say with me, Jesus Christ, I make you the Lord of my life. I surrender myself to your will, not mine. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And Father, I know you're just and have forgiven me because I ask. I will never turn my back on you. I believe you will be the Lord of my life forever. And I thank you for that and accept that into my life right now. Amen. Now give the Lord a praise clap in this house. Hallelujah. Open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to pick up where we've been left off, left off a couple of weeks ago. I was going to move on to something else, but the Holy Spirit just began to really deal with me about something that I think is so imperative for all of our walks as a Christian. And that is knowing the truth of the Bible. Can I tell you today, it is a sad statement, but people do not know the Bible today like they did 25 years ago. In fact, most people, they say that 80% of all people that even go to church never open their Bible one time a week. In ministry, uh, I had the privilege yesterday of interviewing a number of candidates to be licensed through our movement, our fellowship in Woodland with Pastor Mike and uh, we had people, young couples come through, young ladies and men that are being licensed and many of them are starting out or going to break ministry ground for the Lord in their life and yet at the same time, I don't know that any of us sometimes, it, it, how many of you know, you can become so comfortable as a Christian that you somewhere get in your mind that you don't need the Bible anymore, that you know scripture, that you go to church and hear sermons. But how many of you know, as much as I would love to say my sermons are great, they minister to people, you will never hear from this pulpit that you don't need to read your Bible. Because in ministry, many people suffer from depression, ready to quit. In fact, more pastors resign on Monday than any other day of the week. Simply because of the pressures that are on them in life. But there's also a unique statistic in that. 90% of pastors that quit or give up or suffer from depression don't read their Bible on a daily basis. Because what they find is only 3% that do read their word and allow the word to work in their life. They struggle with things. They have hardships in their life, but they don't quit. Come on, church, are you here? And I know if it happens in ministry, it happens in those seats sitting out there. The word of God is so imperative to you, I cannot tell you the importance of it. But what I can do this morning is teach you that the word of God is alive, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It can speak into your life things that no man can take away and no man can give. You have to understand the power of the word to really want to get hungry for it. And what I found even in my own personal life, there are times I get busy doing for God instead of serving God. And I've seen things change in my life, but if I've learned one thing, I've learned I cannot do without the Word of God. Because if I do, I also would want to give up. I also would know depression would knock on my door. Are you here this morning? Because what I'm about to break to you this morning, I believe, is more than a word, more than a sermon. It is a message right from the throne of God. And I don't say that because it's me giving it. I think that the word is not spoken enough in most churches. They talk a lot about current events and politics and different things, and those are all important to our lives. But without the word, nothing is important. It is a word that carries the anointing to keep me straight. 
And it is a word that carries the anointing to keep you straight. David said in the Psalms, it is a light to my path that I may not stumble against God. And so, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 14, we've been talking about this. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words of no profit or to no profit. You know, how many of you would agree our words mean something? They mean something either to the person we're talking to, the air we really see. I don't know about you, but I notice that a little, the, the little older I get, the more I talk to myself. <laughs> and Sandy and I will be rocking around the house, and both of us will do this to each other. We'll go, what? And we'll go, no, I wasn't saying anything. I was just talking to myself. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about in this room? I mean, you know, you kind of, yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry, guys. <laughs> I couldn't help that. I just kind of had to throw that out there. But, uh, but words have power, church. The words that we speak have such great power that I'm not sure any of us really grasp the power they really hold. And can I tell you, I hear a lot of things today. I see a lot of things that... I, I've read a quote. I, I did a teacher teaching to some pastors two weeks ago, and... I called what I taught the courage to lead. How many of you know you have to have courage today to lead? Because when you stand up for the truth, not everybody's going to agree with it. When you stand up for what's right, not everybody's going to agree with it. I think you need courage to be a Christian today. But one of the things I talked about is the courage to stand up for the truth. Because I think we live in a world, sadly enough, that most people don't want to speak the truth. I remember reading a quote, and I read to them, and this is what it said. A person that can never admit they're wrong love themselves more than they love the truth. Let me repeat that. A person that loves themselves, or a person that cannot admit they're ever wrong, love themselves more than they love the truth. Because all of us miss the mark. All of us come short sometimes. And we need to be able to understand that the truth makes us free according to the scripture. And a lot of people are chained up in life because they won't seek the truth. And the truth only comes from this word. Now I say that because I believe we live in a time that is, is tragic to me. We're about ready to enter into an election in a few weeks, and I believe it's one of the most important times of history. But that's not really what I look at sometimes when I watch politicians. And I don't care which party it is. I'm not talking about being favorable or telling you how you vote. I will tell you, I think you do need to vote. Amen. And you need to vote your conscience, not your political party, Amen. or what the world is trying to say. You need to vote your conscience. But I say that with all concern, to, to be misunderstood, but something concerns me that's going on in political arenas today, and no longer does anybody have to speak the truth. They can lie without any facts. And yet we wonder why our kids are in trouble in high school. They have nobody to look to that's going to stand up and say, I'm going to back my words up. I'm going to live the words that I speak out of my mouth. I'm not just going to say something without knowing the facts behind it. Hello out there. So often it's so easy to just let things fall out of our mouth without knowing really the ramifications that it's going to take. And most of the time when we do that, we're trying to sway someone to our opinion. I'm looking for people today that the truth makes them free. That's right. That the anointing of the truth comes into their life so strong that they want the truth right. no matter where it leads. Yes. A quote from Thomas, and Je Thomas Jefferson said these words, follow the truth wherever it leads you. How many of you know sometimes it's not easy where the truth leads us? But Pearl Bailey said this, 
You can never know yourself until you find the truth. You can never be free until you find yourself. That's why truth is so imperative in our life. And we need people that are going to stand up for the truth. And I say this because our words mean something. I don't care what politicians are doing. I don't care what our world's atmosphere is that they're living in. For the atmosphere of every Christian, we have people looking at our life that are saying, don't tell me what you will do. Don't tell me what you know. Can I watch you for a while? We've got to understand the real power of the anointing of truth. And until we come into that, we will really never, we will keep having idle words to no profit. The second thing that it says here, and we've covered, which is so important also, it says to render or to be diligent to present yourself acceptable to God. Now I said a few weeks ago that how many of you know, I love people, I want to be liked. I don't think anybody wakes up in the morning and says, I hope everybody hates me when I run into them today. <laughs> But what I want more is I want to please God Amen. more than man. Because when I please man, all I'm doing is tickling my ears of what I'm really hearing. But when I'm learning and loving and caring to please God, I'm seeking his way and not mine. I want his voice over the voice of praise. I want his voice over the voice of just tickling my ears. I want his voice over how I feel today to speak to me and say, you good and faithful servant, you kept the word, you do what I say. Pastor Mike and I have been, had to travel together the last weekend and you know, you can't imagine two preachers stuck in a car for four hours. It was like there was great silence for about 30 seconds. <laughs> you women, don't shout out too loud and laugh too hard. And you guys, I've been hunting with you. Don't tell me this stuff. That, oh, I'm seeking God. I'm going to be praying, Pastor, on my way up there. Oh, no, you're not. You're going to be telling how big that deer is you're going to kill or, that, or lying about the fish you caught. Yeah. Well, it is that big, you know. I mean... Oh, but we had some time to talk and we was talking about revelation and, and a lot of people I, I kind of wonder if they recognize the pleasing God part of life anymore it's almost like they want to please himself or please others to get that praise and that pat on the back more than they really want to please God and I will love you anyway but I want to tell you it takes real courage to stand for truth. Because not everybody's going to agree with you when you stand for truth. And the power of truth will absolutely make you different than you've ever been in your life. And so, with that being said, we need to be pleasers of God and quit worrying so much about the popular vote. That's why uh, some of the pastors that we interviewed yesterday, they were talking, and many churches have councils and different things. And Look, I'm not saying they're wrong. They have to set up their own government that they run. But you won't see me ever in this church vote. So if you're looking for a voting church, you're in the wrong place. Because most votes are popularity contests. They're not spiritual giants. You don't, you don't always get people on boards that are really there as spiritual people. They're popular. And, and really, we set our churches up in America the wrong way because we vote on things because we live in what we call a republic or a democratic society where elections are supposed to be the, the norm, and I understand that. But that doesn't mean, how many of you know, though we live in a country, what does the Bible say about elections? I'm going to tell you, the only place you will ever find in the New Testament that they voted on anything is when they crucified Christ. Think about it. Look at it. A lot of people have said to me, well, what about when they had elders? And they said, deacons, look at among you. It said, look at among you and appoint. It never said one word about election. Look for it yourself in the Greek. It never once said election. Because the last thing we need is to have a man or woman with vision 
And then people that were elected that aren't even spiritual telling them what they're going to be doing. I'll try that over here. Hallelujah. No. You have to understand that there's reasons why when we set up, a, a, if you will, a church, the reason why we run it the way we do. It's not because I'm afraid of votes. It's because it's not scriptural. And I want to please God more than I want to please man. And so you have to understand, I, mean, I know that that would rub a lot of people the wrong way. We've had people come through here that says, well, why don't we vote? And I say, well, you need to find somewhere else. I love you, but you need to be happy. If your vote is really going to make you happy in the church, then that's what you need to find. But how many of you know, normally their vote doesn't make them happy. If you're an unhappy person, if they don't get their way, then they whine about that. I said, and then they whine about that. Oh, you guys got quiet there for a moment. I was just a little concerned. But you have to understand, I don't do things just to please men. I want to please God. I want to do what the Word of God says, because to me, that's His book, His reference to my life in every area, and is the reference of the church's life. Good preaching, Pastor. Can somebody say amen in this house? The next thing he says is to really be diligent to present yourself acceptable to God, a workman that needs not be ashamed. And this is where we left off. How many of you know, I don't think we would be ashamed because we sinned. Praise God for grace. Yes. We've all missed the mark somewhere because that's really what sin means is to miss the mark. Has anybody ever in here? I mean, I'm a pretty good shot. And a lot of people I hunt with, it's, it's very seldom I ever miss at something I shoot at. But I have missed. And I threw my gun down, stomped my feet, and got mad. <laughs> Not really. I'm just kidding. Gosh, I love stories. I'm hunting with a pastor friend of mine over on the east side out of Red Bluff, and, and uh, we're hunting deer. And we had shot this one deer, and so this guy and I went down, and we were cleaning it up, and we, put it in the, we drove the truck over there and put it in. And, and this hill had been totally scraped, and, and I was sitting where this pastor had been when this, I seen these deer coming down the hill, and, and this one guy lived in Southern California, and I went and got him, and I said, I think if you'll sit right here, you'll be able to, I think these deer, I seen the last one was a buck, I think these deer are going to come right down through this valley here, and sure enough, he did, and he shot it. We went down there, well, when I was down there, and we got all done, we opened up a soda, and we're sitting on the tailgate, and all of a sudden, we heard a shot, and I looked up, and you could see the silhouette of this pastor. I mean, it really well, it looked a little bigger than that. We weren't too far away. And I, I looked, probably about from here to McDonald's, and, and he was on top of this hill. And remember, there was no trees or anything. The hill had been totally scraped. And so you could see a silhouette in the sunlight, and you see this bam, 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 bam. Bam! <laughs> you think I'm kidding. I mean, he shot seven times at this deer. Seven times. And when he got done, you know how he knew he didn't get it? No, he threw his hat. He threw his hat on the ground <laughs> and started stomping on his hat, literally. I'm not exaggerating. I mean, he just threw his hat down and was jumping up and down. I had never seen him praise God like that. <laughs> so I knew he wasn't praising God. He tried to tell me later, I was praising God. I said, don't give me that. I've worshipped with you. I've never seen you lift your feet, much less jump up and down. But church, you know, just because somebody thinks that something's going to make them happy, if they still don't get their way, they're not going to be happy. Come on, church, are you here? And so be careful, really, to recognize that you need to be not ashamed. Now, what makes us ashamed? I talked about four things really quickly. Number one, I would hate to stand before God and say I didn't walk in my love walk. Because the word said God is love. And they that know God should know love. For if they don't know love, they don't know God. Look, I know it's not always easy to love people. I know it's not easy to get over things. I know how hard it is because the second thing is forgiveness and love and forgiveness goes so close. See, if you love God enough, you can forgive. But if you don't love God, you'll hold anger and bitterness in your life. 
I don't know about you, what would make me ashamed is not some great sin I've done, but to not walk in the attributes that God has given me to walk in, that I know I can't walk in by myself, but I can walk in in the power of God. Right. See, I can't forgive or love either without the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. <laughs> to be able to pray and be in the Word and say, I speak love, blessings, and forgiveness over them. Or number three, afraid to really suffer for the Lord. Now listen to me very carefully. I said a couple of weeks ago, but it's so true. You know, maybe you did some bonehead thing and people are upset about it. Well, don't blame the devil for that. If you did some bonehead thing, just say, I did some bonehead thing because I've done plenty of them. I don't tell Sandy, but I have done them. Oh, that's right, she's in the room. Oh, wow. But don't get mad about that. What I'm talking about is suffering when you make a stand for what is right. See, it says we will suffer for the sake of the gospel, for the word of God. When you make a stand and say, I don't believe today in abortion. Now listen, I will love you. If you've had an abortion, God can forgive you. He will love you. He will never, he'll put it in the sea of forgiveness. You never have to have that be brought up again. And people should love you. But I'm not going to stand and say it was right when he says, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. So conception doesn't start anywhere. It started before you even got here. A lot of people say, well, it started at conception. No, the scripture says, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. So you have to make a stand. And not everybody's going to agree when you make a stand. Now, we love them and we appreciate them. And there's no, it is not right to do harm to anybody. But you still will suffer when you make a stand. And many people are afraid to make a stand because they want to be popular or popular with some group, when I am telling you, if you make a stand for God, you are going to suffer a little. Because the world is not always going to agree with you. Or maybe you make a stand to say, no, I don't believe in same-sex marriage. I believe it's how God set it up in the Garden of Eden when he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And not everybody will be, we love those people. You should never badmouth people, but you do need to make a stand if you're confronted with what you believe in. And we've all been affected by it. Every person in this room probably knows somebody or has somebody in their family that has given themselves over to that lifestyle. But that doesn't mean you have to accept it. And it doesn't mean you need to make excuses. The word is powerful enough to hold up on its own. And I only say this not because I'm so anti-everything, but look, I realize when I make a stand, I'm going, to have, I'm going to have some consequences. I'm going to have some people that aren't going to like me making a stand for what I know this word talks about. And so we have to understand the power of suffering for God. The last thing is we can't be self-centered. How many of you know it isn't all about you? It's about us. It's the group. And all you have to do, I had to be in San Jose two weeks, or last weekend, actually I was there a week ago today. How many of you know they drive crazy down there? <laughs> I mean, I love going to the Bay Area, but man, I can get so easily frustrated that I have to speak in tongues half the way home. I mean, you know, uh, most of you know I know Dick, and gosh, we're down there, and just everybody's driving everywhere. They're going crazy. And I'm like, my goodness. And I've never seen Pastor Sandy. She gets so upset anymore. And she's not an upset person. Because, I mean, people cut you off. They, you know, I thought one car was going to hit us. They drifted over so far. Sandy goes, what's the matter with them? I said, they're not paying attention. 
Probably on their cell phone. Whoops, sorry. I told you you wouldn't like me. But openly, we see a lot of that going on in life. And how many of you know, you better be really saved if you're going to drive in a major city today. <laughs> I mean, really saved, you know what I mean? Come on, church, are you here? And so, <laughs> it's not all about you, because like I tell Sandy, honey, they think they're the only one on the road. That's what I mean. They really drive like that. I mean, you know, but I have learned to, to really walk in forgiveness, I, because I will never tell you how many times I've kind of drifted off. <laughs> I'm by myself, I'm not, I used to drive for a living, I mean, I used to cover a lot of miles, and, you know, man, pretty, you know, if you drive enough miles, you're kind of, you're not driving. <laughs> you might be behind the wheel, but you're not driving. Yeah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're looking at the road, but you're not looking at the road? Yeah. You're straight ahead with your head, but your mind is four miles back? Yeah. Come on, church, are, am I the only one that ever does this? I mean... So, I mean, give people a break. world isn't all about you. It's about us. Caring about others. I don't want to stand before my maker at the end of my time and say, I didn't care. All I cared about is satisfying myself. Church, we've got to understand these are important things. Those are the things that should make us ashamed. Not because some words slipped out our mouth. I mean, hopefully you'll clean that up. But what about the attributes that God really wants? Things like love and forgiveness and suffering for him and having self-control. See, self-control is one of the nine gifts, fruit of the Spirit. They're bookends. If you've ever studied that passage, it begins with love and ends with self-control. And they're like bookends to all the rest that's in between. And so if you have love and self-control, most likely you're going to have most of the others. But if you don't have, it's like a book trying to hold books up. They just keep falling down. Good preaching, Pastor. Can I get an amen in this house? So let's look at some things. Because what I want to take you over the next couple of weeks is, I think if we are going to stand and stand alone for what is right, we have to love truth more than we love anything else. And the only way we find truth is in the next passage he says these words rightly dividing the word of truth everybody say rightly dividing rightly dividing the word of truth say that out loud the new king or the king james says study show yourself approved rightly dividing how many of you know that people do not study the word today they read a lot of books and listen, I praise God. I mean, I've had the privilege to be an author and, and it's great. And I know some of you even that are new here have just read my book and, and I appreciate the love that you give and the compliments you give. But how many of you know my book can't take the place of this book? No book you can ever read can take the place of this book. Because see, they deal with maybe fasting or prayer or unity or or whatever, trouble in marriage, or raising kids, and all of that is good, but how many of you know it doesn't take the place of this book? You have to study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. This book is called the word of truth. Now, with that being said, I quoted some quotes to you, but let me do it again. Follow the truth wherever it leads. You'll never find yourself until you find the truth. If you can never admit you're wrong, you love yourself more than you love the truth. See, that's real truth. So I want to tell you right now that if we're going to do that, I think, and first foremost, this is almost like a history lesson. I'm going to be quick through this this morning. But we have to look at the Bible. If you're going to study this thing and you're going to break this apart and you're going to be somewhat as what they call study, to study something means to get in depth. And how many of you know what's in this word doesn't just lay on the surface? But you have to indulge yourself in the word of God. You have to dive into the word of God and find and pull out the nuggets. Because a lot of times the nuggets, how many of you know, 
that everybody rushed to California in 1849 because everybody was saying it's laying all over the ground. All you got to do is walk by and pick it up. How many of you know that 98% of all people who came to California went back more broke than they came? That's how amazing people can be. They can just think it's so easy. How many of you know studying the word is not easy? You have to be a student. You have to be a learner. You have to be teachable. You have to be open. But I think something misses sometimes from the pulpits of America. We don't tell you about the history of this book. So I want to take a few moments and just kind of run through a couple of things that I think every person should know. In fact, after the first, ser the first uh, service this morning, people said, so I'm going to print this out for you, and I'll have it in a bulletin next week in a piece of paper, so you can keep it. But the first thing I want you to understand is this. This book is 66 books with 40 different authors, approximately, and it was written over 2,000 years. Yet number two, it has no disparity nor no error. You know, people talk about antiques. When you hold this in your hand, you're holding something that is 4,000 years old. What do you think that's worth? If you had a vase or something that was 4,000 years old, it would be worth millions of dollars. Yet we lay this 4,000-year-old book on our table and never pick it up until we go out the door to church again. And when you hold it in your hand, you are holding a 4,000-year-old writing that was written just for you. God knowing the color of the Bible you would have. You have to understand, this book is 66 books with 40 different authors with no heirs. Somebody ought to be going, ooh. I can't find much without any flaws today. Yet it doesn't stop there. It was written by politicians Moses, fishermen Peter, herdsmen Amos, military leaders Joshua, cupbearers Nehemiah, prime ministers Daniel, doctors lawyer, or doctor Luke, uh, Luke, kings Solomon and David, and tax collectors Matthew. I mean, it was written by an array, and I could go on and on with a litany of really who it was written by and what their job was. So it wasn't professional writers. It wasn't people that just set them aside. They sat down and wrote the will of God so that you and I may have it today to live by and pull out the blessings of God. Amen. Woo, glory to God. I'm getting excited up here. <laughs> Number four, it was written in three different continents, on three different continents. Asia, Africa, and Europe. Every one of those continents, part of this book was written on. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Everybody say Greek. Greek. Now say it's all Greek to me. <laughs> the biggest part of the New Testament was written in Greek. And when you study for either exiting Jesus out of the Bible or you study, if you will, the power to go on and be licensed in a way from a major college. You have to study Greek to really understand this book. And you have to understand because how many of you know Greek is a unique language. It's so powerful. It's not like America where America mainly has definitions of one word that's sort of the same. Greek, uh, if you remember when Chip Brim was here years ago, Greek has many spokes to every word. Greeks have many meanings. It has one main meaning, but then many meanings break off of that word. And if you're going to study to show yourself a proof, sometimes you're going to have to define a word to really understand what it means in the word of God. Something like really, like the word perfection. The word perfection really in Greek means grown up or mature. It means that when you can act in perfection, he's not talking about being perfect. He's talking about acting like an adult. 
And so when he breaks this down to you, see, you have to understand what's in this book, what you've got in your hand before you can really want to become a student of it. Are you getting anything out of this? Because I know it might just be litany or, or kind of like almost a class to you, but you need to understand this book. Now listen to these quotes I wrote down. The Bible has been read by more people and published in more languages than any single book ever written. Number seven. Yeah, you can say amen. Yeah. There's been more copies of the Bible produced than any other book in history. And it is still the number one seller right. around the world today. I mean, that's what you hold in your hand. Every time or you walk in the room, every time you read out of this thing, do you realize what you're holding in your hand? See, sometimes doing the history on something gives you a little better understanding of what you really have. And listen to this. The Bible is both ancient and modern. If you want to study history, you can study it. If you want to know the future, you can study it. Isn't that powerful? I mean, that can make me run a little. I mean, I mean, I lo because I love history. I mean, I just love history. I have so many history books that, you know, I, every war I know about certain battles because in, almost in every war that America has ever been in or even major conflicts in Europe in the early centuries before Jesus, there was a turning point and a decision made by the general or the leader of those armies that either made the right decision or the wrong decision, and that cost them the war. They might have won battles even after that, but it cost them the war because of one decision. And because I draw decisions from things, I like to kind of know that because I don't want to be caught with my pants down. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, what in the heck is he talking about? <laughs> okay, let me put it in another way. I don't want to come up short not knowing the truth because the decision I make could be the deciding factor of the battle I'm fighting. And if I don't find that in the Word, where am I going to find it? So see, I want to, I want to know it's a book of history, but I also want to know it's a book of the future. See, when you know these things about the Word, it takes on a whole other meaning. Number nine, it has been attacked, and why king and rulers have tried to destroy it, it still remains and grows. More people and nations than ever before are reading the Bible. Glory to God. More people and more people and more people, and I don't think it'll ever stop until Jesus returns. Because it's more than really, I keep saying book, but it is God's handbook to our life. Because the Bible is unique in the fullness of prophecy. No other book ever written has fulfilled more prophecy or will fulfill more prophecy in the future than this one book. That's how powerful it is. It's fulfilling so many prophecies. Even as I speak, it is fulfilling things around the world that it was written about three and 4,000 years ago. Number 11. The Bible is unique in its teaching. The Bible teaches us to deal and how to deal with every circumstance of life. Everything you will ever need, whether it coming to how you do things in life, is found in this one book. It's not encyclopedias. It's not a dictionary. But this book can answer every question you ever have about anything. Can you get excited in here? Because I, I know this, like I said, I know it's like a teaching of a class, but you need to understand what this book does and what you're holding in your hand. Because it's powerful when you understand it in that light. The anointing of God is upon it. And then lastly, look at this. The Bible is unique in its influence in the world. No other book has left its mark like the Bible has in translating lives, transforming lives, in influencing nations. 
Our founding father said, this country can never remain without one book called the Bible. Literally, that's what our founding father said. This nation can never remain. Literally, the foundation of the greatest, earth, greatest country on earth was founded, and many of its qualities was pulled from this book. I mean, that's pretty powerful, church. Maybe you're not influenced by that, but I sure am. Because let me tell you, this book is the book of truth. You can't find it outside this book. But you need to understand a little bit about the historical background behind this book. Because when you know the historical background and you open this book, how many of you know, you just don't take it for granted. Now we're going to be getting into some things in the next few weeks where we understand this book is spirit, life, and power. We're going to be getting into some things like the Bible is God's will made known to us so that we can walk in his blessings. Without getting in this book, you don't know what belongs to you. But when you get in this book, you can claim what belongs to you. Amen. See, that's why the enemy fights this book so hard. Because he doesn't want us in the book. Because as long as we're in the book, we're timid and shy and unsure of ourselves. But the moment we understand what the Word of God says about us, we are now a threat to the kingdom of darkness. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise clap in this house. And so, see, it's more than a book. It is the book. The one book. The book that changed your life and mine. This book has great meaning for all of us. No matter what you're going through today, no matter what, what trial you're walking in, I'm here to tell you, this book has an answer. This book will get you where you need to go. Now listen to me. You have to be diligent to want to be in this book. Because after a while, like any of us, the honeymoon's over. I remember the first two years I was saved. I could not lay this book down. Now you know that it's God when football's on and I couldn't lay this book down. I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be in the Word because I knew it would keep me from wanting to quit and give up. But so many times, like everyone I think in this room, I became challenged. I got busy. And the next thing you know, I started feeling the old man coming back. But God didn't turn me away. God didn't give up on me. The moment I got back in that book, I felt that new man again. I felt that anointing that destroys the yoke coming back into me. And I want to tell you, you're sitting out there and some of you are dry as a grasshopper on a griddle. And I'm telling you, there's water for you to dip yourself in out of this book. But you have to determine that's what you want. You have to say to yourself, God, I'm hungry today. But I'm not hungry for food. I'm not hungry for self. I'm not hungry for compliments. I'm hungry for the living word and the bread of God. Church, when we do that, I don't care what you're going through, how good or bad it is, God can change that circumstance. But you have to be in the Word. Let me tell you how the Word can change you. Sometimes, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I guess, I had to go down to DMV. How many of you, you better be prayed up when you go there. And I don't say that toward them. I really don't. If you know anybody I'm just saying when I pulled my number I pulled 14 the person at the counter was 76 and I'm like oh lord 
And so I sat down. And I'm trying to do as James says, you know, case, patience produces good works in your life. So I thought, I'm not going to complain because all these people around me were complaining. They were complaining so bad the lady at the counter got up and said, I'm sorry, you guys are very disappointed, but we have somebody out that's pregnant and somebody called in sick today, so we will get to you just as soon as we can. And I shut everybody up. But I pulled my phone out. This is a good, this tr true story. I was going to play solitaire on my phone. And I thought, you know, I got my Bible on my phone. And so I hit my app and opened my Bible. I read four books of the Bible while I was sitting there. First, second, and third John, and most of Matthew. And when they called my name, I almost didn't want them to call my number, you know what I mean? I mean, when they call my, I'm like, man, I'm enjoying this. I'm sitting in a crowded room. So see, this book has unique power. It doesn't have to be on paper. It can be on your phone. It can be on your iPad. It can be on your computer. And it carries that same, that's so unique. It carries the same anointing. No matter what you put this book on. And I want to tell you right now, church, if you'll commit yourself to the Word, God will change life for you. Because I'm telling you, I've been walking high ever since I sat in DMV. I thought about just going back there and sitting again. I walked out of there, man. I said, you know what? That's what I need more of. I need the Word. Sometimes I'm doing for God. And that's good. But sometimes I need God. And that's the Word. See, it's not about doing good. You can do good. What I want to know is, are you in the Word? Because see, this is 4,000 years written by 40 authors of 60 books just for you, just for me.